Between 1773 and 1777, William Bartram, America's first native-born naturalist, traveled through the Southeast collecting plants and making scientific drawings for his wealthy English patron. In 1791, he published an account of his remarkable four-year adventure, an account that is still one of the most important and beautiful descriptions of the region in the 18th century. William Bartram's unique view of the natural world, expressed through his words and illustrations, inspired generations of scientists and poets. The story of William Bartram's extraordinary travels begins in 1763, when Great Britain acquired all of the land that is now Florida from Spain. King George III, eager to learn about his new land, appointed William's father, John Bartram, as his royal botanist and sent him south to investigate. John Bartram was a self-taught man of science. He lived near Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, where he ran a business growing and selling native plants and seeds to collectors and scientists in Europe. Today, his home and garden are a national historic landmark. John Bartram had several wealthy patrons who sponsored his plant collecting trips. They included aristocrats and successful businessmen whose new wealth, generated by the economic boom of Britain's Industrial Revolution, afforded them the leisure time to indulge in science and botany as a hobby. In the 18th century, intellectuals promoted scientific, rational thought over tradition and superstition as the path to understanding the world and improving human society. Emphasis was placed on ordering the world by recording, cataloging, and classifying its plants, animals, rocks, and minerals. John and William Bartram played an important role in documenting the plants and animals of eastern North America. In 1765, John wrote to his son William with news of his royal appointment and invited him to join his trip to Florida. Dear son William, I received a particular account that our king had appointed me his chief botanist, and I am ordered to go directly to Florida. Our friend Peter ordered me to take my son or a servant with me, and as thee wrote to me last winter, and seemed so very desirous to go there, now thee hath a fair opportunity. Young William Bartram had traveled with his father on other plant collecting trips and was a skilled illustrator. John sent several of William's drawings to his longtime patron, Peter Collinson, a wealthy English merchant who collected plants from around the world. Collinson was impressed with William's artistic abilities and wrote to his friend, Billy's drawing and painting of the Tupelo is fine and is deservedly admired by everyone. At this time, William was living with his uncle in North Carolina, trying unsuccessfully to establish a career as a merchant. He was more than happy to join his father's 10-month excursion through Georgia, Florida, and the Carolinas. The significance of their journey cannot be overstated. The Bartrams were the first English scientists to explore Florida. During this trip, William Bartram became enchanted with Florida. At the end of the journey, he convinced his father to purchase 500 acres of land near Little Florence Cove in St. John's County to start a rice and indigo plantation. John wrote to his friend Peter Collinson, I have left my son Billy in Florida. Nothing will do with him now, but he will be a planter upon the St. John's River about 24 miles from Augustine. This frolic of his hath drove me to great straits. William's efforts at planting were a failure. Within six months, he abandoned his plantation and returned to Philadelphia. In 1772, he wrote to another of his father's longtime patrons, John Fothergill, asking him to sponsor a plant-collecting trip to Florida. Fothergill agreed to sponsor William with equipment and an annual stipend of 50 pounds. In his letter, he set out exactly how William should collect, illustrate, and record the plants he found. In meeting with any new plant in flower, draw the flower and a leaf or two carefully on the spot. Mark the outline of branch or shrub. The rest may be finished at leisure. It will be right to keep a little journal, marking the soil, situation, plants in general, and remarkable animals where found. It will be necessary to send thy journals, when it can be done safely, to Charlestown, lest they should be lost or stolen, which would be an irretrievable loss. 
William set out from Charleston, South Carolina in April 1773 and spent most of the year retracing routes he and his father had taken through Georgia. He attended the Augusta Congress between the Cherokees, Creeks, and British government and joined the team surveying Britain's newly acquired territory. Among the first box of dried specimens and drawings he sent to John Fothergill was an illustration of a plant locals called fly poison. He noted it was used to destroy flying insects, a most useful plant in a country so invested with these troublesome little animals. William spent the winter of 1773 and 1774 in Savannah. In March, he journeyed to East Florida, where he spent the summer exploring the St. John's River. His journal includes delightful descriptions of lush scenery, genial encounters with local Indians, and harrowing descriptions of lightning-filled thunderstorms, swarms of mosquitoes, and alligator attacks. I saw before me through the clear water the head and shoulders of a very large alligator moving slowly towards me. It was certainly most providential that I looked up at that instant, as the monster would probably, in less than a minute, have seized and dragged me into the river. As he continued his journey south, sometimes on horseback, sometimes by canoe, William visited the plantation of Francis Philip Facio at New Switzerland. At Palatka, he headed west to the Indian town of Cuscoilla and the Alachua Savanna, known today as Payne's Prairie Preserve State Park. It was here that William met the Seminole chief, Cowcatcher, who gave him permission to travel through Creek Land and honored him with the name Puck Buggy, or Flower Hunter. Bartram spent the summer exploring Alachua before returning to Palatka and continuing his travels up the St. John's to Lake George. Bartram left Florida and returned to Charleston, where he rested during the fall of 1774. He sent nearly 30 drawings, along with three large boxes of roots and one box of seeds to John Fothergill. In spring of 1775, William wrote his father that he planned to continue his travels and was setting off for the mountains of Carolina and Georgia. Here, he visited the Cherokee towns of Seneca and Cowie before joining a group of traders heading south to the Gulf Coast. The group followed an old trading path and reached Mobile, Alabama in late July. At Mobile, William discovered the giant evening primrose, a flower he described as the most pompous and brilliant herbaceous plant yet known to exist. While exploring the area around Mobile, he contracted an illness that affected his eyesight. Despite this setback, Bartram visited Pensacola before heading west again, determined to reach the Mississippi River. Bartram arrived just south of Baton Rouge in the late fall of 1776, fulfilling his father's dream of seeing the mighty Mississippi. At evening, arrived at Manchac, where I directed my steps to the banks of the Mississippi, where I stood for a time, as it were, fascinated by the magnificence of the great sire of rivers. Here he finally gave in to his poor health and ended his journey west, writing, I submitted and determined to return to Carolina. Bartram spent the summer of 1776 revisiting East Florida and coastal Georgia. He rediscovered Franklinia, a beautiful flowering tree he and his father identified in 1765. This time, William was able to collect seeds, which he planted in his father's botanical garden. All Franklin trees known to exist today are descended from these seeds. As tension between Great Britain and its American colonies turned into open rebellion, William grew concerned about his father and decided to return to Pennsylvania. He arrived at his father's home in January 1777. He lived there for the next 46 years, helping to run the family seed business, writing, tutoring, drawing, and entertaining the many guests who continued to visit the garden. William Bartram died at the age of 84 in 1823. Throughout his travels, William Bartram recorded his adventures in a series of journals, which he sent to John Fothergill. Bartram used his notes and journals to write an account of his excursions, which he published in 1791 as Travels Through North and South Carolina, Georgia, East and West Florida. His descriptions of East Florida were some of the most colorful. He described an endless array of birds, fishes, reptiles, and mammals, each in Bartram's unique style. 
His descriptions of alligators were so vivid that his readers at the time did not believe such creatures existed. Behold him rushing forth from the flags and reeds. His plated tail, brandished high, floats upon the lake. The waters, like a cataract, descend from his opening jaws. Clouds of smoke issue from his dilated nostrils. Eventually, eight editions of William's book were published in six countries. Although it had its critics, travels influenced both scholars and poets. His picturesque language found its way into the works of Coleridge, Wordsworth, and Thoreau. As scientists, John and William Bartram described and cataloged over 200 species of birds and over 350 plants and animals, 150 of which were completely new to science. The work of the Bartrams laid the foundation for a new, homegrown scientific community in the new United States. Exploration and documentation of America by Americans helped forge an independent identity, separate from Great Britain and Europe. Today, William Bartram's scenic and historic highway commemorates Bartram's contributions to our understanding of the natural world in Florida and throughout eastern North America. In the spirit of William Bartram, the William Bartram Scenic and Historic Highway Corridor Management Group, local communities, and St. Johns County work to protect and preserve this beautiful highway and the splendid vistas of the St. Johns, an American heritage river. Together, they promote the area's unique historical, cultural, and recreational opportunities.